In the Sea of Moyle, situated six miles off Bally Castle on the north coast of Ireland, lies the island of Rathlin. It is one of Ulster's only inhabited islands, and today is regarded as a place of peace and tranquility, a welcome escape from the business and hyperactivity of the 21st century, and hearkening back to a simple time where people and nature lived in balance. At the western end of the island, sheer cliffs rise more than a hundred meters above raised beaches of rounded cobbles, while towering stacks of rock stand guard just offshore. This is the townland of Kebble, derived from the Irish on Kebble, meaning the chapel or burying ground. Its 308 acres now consist mainly of heathland and bog, though there are also quite a few cairns dotted around the landscape here, including a particularly large one known as the High Seat of Rathlin, which marks the highest point on the island. They stand alone like great monoliths in the heather, their presence suggesting that Kebble used to be a more populated area. And indeed, Kebble did have a significant cluster of clackens, or small settlements in the 1830s. The census figures show that there were six houses and 47 people living in this cluster in 1841, though during the Great Famine of Ireland in 1845, most of these settlements were abandoned, and by 1861 there was only one house with seven people living in it, and by 1881 the townland was completely deserted. The area is now entirely abandoned. Well, apart from a herd of free-spirited cows and the odd bus or cyclist heading to the West Light Seabird Centre. Oh, and I suppose there's also upwards of over 300,000 seabirds at the height of the breeding season, but other than that, there's not a soul to be seen. The only habitable building now left standing in Kebble is this stone cottage, known simply as Kebble Cottage. But before you go rushing off to plan a long weekend stay here, you should know that this humble cottage is allegedly the most haunted spot on Rathlin. For there are rumours that something truly frightening dwells amidst these stone walls. An omen of doom. A harbinger of death. A ban she. A woman of the she, of the other world, whose ghostly wailing has been reported around this isolated cottage and across the rolling heathland of Kebel. And yes, there are those that will say these are just the rasping calls of the wayward Manx Shearwater, one of the many residents of the seabird sanctuary here. Yet as we approach the dark times of the year, it is difficult not to feel somewhat unsettled and unnerved when walking past this cottage, especially at night. For during the time known as Samhain, the days grow shorter and the nights stretch longer and longer until it seems as though the light itself has perished, smothered by the all-encompassing gloom. This is the time when the veil between our world and the one below are thinned, allowing denizens from the other world to pass through tears and gateway in the she or fairy hills and into our world. Creatures of the dark and spirits of the night. Creatures like the Banshee, warning that the season of death is on its way. But no, this is all just superstition, surely. They're just the innocent calls of a seabird. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes, just a bird. Right. The Banshee is a herald of death in the Irish folklore. Her awful screams are often heard before death, only ceasing when a spirit has left its body, getting sucked away to the mystical other world. She's been described in many different ways throughout the centuries. Some claim to have seen a Banshee combing her long, silky hair as it glistens in the twilight around her whereas others have seen her flying through the night with eyes red and raw from endless weeping, her sorrow never ceasing as she flits between death after death. In flight, some believe that she may even shapeshift into animals, like the spectral barn owl, 
the knightly assassin whose wails are often thought to be a banshee. She's often described as being small and frail, though she may also be significantly taller, unnaturally long and slender. A younger woman who seems to be in the prime of good health. And this depiction of the banshee often describes her as being a girl who died young, who now comes before the dying members of her own family, ready to welcome them into the cold, eternal embrace of death. This version of the banshee can be a more soothing presence, her sweet and tender songs a far cry from the harsh shrieks of the more crone-like banshee. In Ireland and some parts of Scotland, one of the traditions during the mourning process is to have a weeping woman present, a ban kionta, who cries a lament. In Irish, this wailing is known as keening, or kiena. The keening woman may sometimes even be a professional, employed strictly in the services of keening. Some of the best keeners were well sought after, for it was believed that this wailing honoured the souls of the dead and helped to bring them safely to the land of the she. The origins of this tradition are perhaps a response to the screams of the Banshee, who in this case is seen as a more calming presence, more of a vessel to help a lost soul find its way to its next destination. The Banshee's lament has even been reported by families who have lost one of their own in far-off lands, even before news of the death had reached their ears. As such, the Banshee is often regarded as a predictor of death being the first to warn a household that a death is on its way. She is sometimes seen lurking nearby a person who is about to enter a dangerous situation, either warning them with her spectral screeching or patiently waiting for the death to transpire, depending on which of the stories you believe. She even has been said to summon the terrifying death coach, the Kostjebauer, driven by the nightmarish headless horseman on Duglochan. But that's a story for another time. Let's not get carried away with ourselves, eh? And there are those who believe that the Banshee will only appear for families of pure ancient Irish lineage. Those who claim to trace ancestry from the Milesians, the Iberian people who travelled to Ireland thousands of years ago, seizing control of the island and driving the mythical Tua de Danann deep down into the Shi. But again, story for another time. Most, but not all, of these ancient families have the prefix Mac or O at the start of their surnames, meaning son of or grandson of, respectively. Thus, families like the McCarthys are said to have their own personal banshee, appearing when one of their own is about to breathe their last. As such, there are many terrifying tales about the banshee from all over Ireland that have been scaring children and adults alike for centuries. One story is about a man named Ronan, who was beloved by all who knew him. He was a cattle farmer by trade and lived alone in an isolated cottage along with his young daughter, Ashleen. Now, if he was well respected, she was absolutely adored and doted on by everyone in the surrounding area. She was kind, caring and compassionate, but also free-spirited and adventurous. She was an astonishing horse rider for one so young, one of the best around, and she could only have been, what, 11 or 12 years old? But still she rode like a hurricane, hard and fast and true, a flash of whipping hair accompanied by the relentless pattering of her horse's hooves. She rode like nothing could ever catch her, for in truth nothing really could, and oh she relished the feeling of freedom and exhilaration that horse riding gave her. Any opportunity she had, she would be there, galloping across the heathland from dawn until dusk if she had the time. She was the paragon of youthful happiness, and everyone who saw her couldn't help but smile. Ashleen was the pride of the village, but she was beloved by her father, Ronan, most of all. For in truth, she was all he had. His wife had died in childbirth, but he had poured all the love of both parents into their child, so that she had the best possible start in life. She helped him around the farm and in the house too, and after a day's work the two of them would make dinner and eat in front of the warm fire, where he would regale her with fantastical stories about fairies and magic. Both were as happy as could be in each other's company, snuggled up there in their warm cottage and safe from the cold of the outside world. 
and that was how it had been for most of her young life, until one especially exciting night during the festival of Samhain. For there was a great celebration happening in the village, commemorating the end of the harvest season, where everyone was allowed to have one final bit of crack before the dark times of the year set in. Almost everybody in the village was there, dressed up in all manner of scary costumes to frighten away the otherworldly spirits that were free to wander around during this time. A great bonfire had been erected outside, which people were casting little stones into, all to remember and commemorate their ancestors who had come before them. Children went around rhyming off little verses in exchange for something to eat, while most adults made use of the abundance of food and drink that had been spread out to all. Everyone was having an absolute blast, singing and dancing, having a tankard or two of cider and then a tankard or two more until they could barely even see the tankard there in front of them. Oh, it was great. They were all having the best time, surrounded by friends and family and loved ones. And Ashleen was no exception. She was racing around with her friends, ducking and weaving her way through the feast and stuffing her face with any tasty morsels she encountered along her way. She had dressed up as the terrifying Dulacan, but it didn't take long to lose the old broomstick that was playing the part of her spectral steed. Ah well, she didn't care, she was too busy running riot around the village, laughing and mucking around with her friends, and every now and again her father Ronan would spot her, and the two would share a quick glance and a smile before she ran off on her way. Ah, it made him so happy to see her out there having fun while the weather was still good because he knew that very soon it would be too dark and stormy to do very much outside at all. And so there he stood, propped up against a tree, drink in hand, and feeling pretty happy with himself, all in all. And that was when he heard a sudden shrill noise, almost like a shriek or someone crying out for help. He couldn't quite place where it was, it sounded like some kind of high-pitched screaming off in the distance somewhere, ringing out across the heathland. Well, whatever it was, it didn't sound good, that's for sure. So he quickly set down his drink and hurried off towards the outskirts of the village, where it seemed like the sound was coming from. He thought that it must have been someone in distress, for the cries were getting increasingly louder and more pain the closer he got. He stepped up his pace, stumbling across the heather and almost tripping over one particularly gnarled and treacherous branch that blocked his path. But that didn't slow him down much though. He was determined to find and help whoever it was that was in such agony. The screeching got louder and louder, sharp and slicing through the chill air like a blade through water. He scoured the landscape but still he couldn't see where it was coming from. But oh, it was getting so loud now that he had to cover his ears, but even this didn't help much. In fact, really it only made matters worse, for now it seemed like the cries were coming from inside his own head, ringing against his skull like a clanging bell being struck over and over again. Oh, that infernal keening, it would not stop, it would not relent, so awful and deafening that it made him want to scream himself. It pierced into his soul, into the very fibre of his being, resonating through his entire body and filling him with such pain and discomfort. Oh, he had to use all the willpower and strength of mind to fight the urge to turn back and run away, for he knew that whoever was making such an awful, ear-splitting, cacophonous racket must be in serious, serious trouble. And just when he felt that he could bear it no longer, when it felt like his head would surely explode under such unrelenting pressure, that's when he saw her crouched beneath the withered limb of a tree. A little old woman was sitting hunched over, screaming out into the vast open expanse of bog. She must have seen him coming, for she finally stopped her horrific screeching and turned round to face him, much to his everlasting relief. But there was still something deeply unsettling about her. For she really was absolutely tiny, almost entirely hidden under that great green shawl of worn cloth. Shriveled skin drooped down from her aged face and frail arms as she wringed her long talon-like fingers together in terrible anguish. 
There was such sorrow and sadness in her expression that it very nearly brought poor Ronan to tears. But her eyes themselves were like hollow sockets, nothing but empty shadows staring back at him that seemed to outright refuse the fading light of the evening around him. Tiny, soulless caverns of infinite and absolute darkness. But even that was not the worst thing about her. For after a few drawn out moments, her frown cracked open like a fracture in a sheet of ice. Her yellowed teeth glistened in the evening light and her ruined lips began to close and open again as the old woman began to speak. Well, at least he thought she must be speaking, although if she was, it was a voice like nothing he had ever heard before or since. It sounded more like a cold wind blowing through the leafless limbs of winter trees, like ancient rock crumbling and plummeting down a mountain slope, annihilating anything in its destructive path. A voice like death itself. And this is what it said to Ronan on that fateful Salmon night. In three days, death. In three days, the grave. Dead. 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 Three times the voice came, and three times he heard the words, those awful words that would stay with him for the rest of his mortal life. They echoed through the trees, bounced off the rocks, and rose up into the night sky. But as they did, Ronan looked all around him, back at the tree where she had been sitting, but no, the banshee was nowhere to be seen. He wasn't really sure what had just happened. Had he just had a bit too much to drink? Or had he really just seen what he thought he saw? A phantom of death from the other world. But for as frightening as this was for Ronan, this was nothing compared to what came next. Because for him, the nightmare was only just beginning. When he eventually stumbled back to the village, pale-faced and eyes wide in terror, he was recognized and called over by a group which were gathered around something. He wasn't sure what. But he quickly found out, although he instantly wished that he hadn't. The ghastly apparition that he saw out there in the bog was nothing compared to seeing his own daughter, Ashley, lying completely still in the heather, all colour drained from her face. His breathing became hard and rasping as he looked around at the vapid faces of his friends and relatives, searching for some kind of answer, and eventually stuttering out, well, What happened? How did she... What, what happened? But it didn't seem like they had much more of an idea about what was going on than he did, which didn't help the fury that was quickly welling up inside of him. He turned his head sharply to Ashleen's petrified friends who were huddled around their mother, glowering at them for an answer but getting nothing. And eventually Cormac the Smith met his frenzied gaze, an honest soul who always seemed to keep a calm, level head even at the most trying of times. He said, look, I don't know what happened, Ronan. Truly, I don't. She was right as rain one moment, playing with them girls there. Then all of a sudden she just drops down to the ground like you see her now. Now I had no physician, but I'd say to go down as quick as she did like that well. It must be something to do with the poor girl's heart. Ronan took in Cormac's words, but they only left him with even more questions. Questions he could barely find the words to formulate into sentences from the crazy whirlwind of thoughts that were colliding round his mind. But she's been fine all night. All her life, there's, she's, there's nothing wrong with her. Do you hear? Nothing wrong. She's, she's just, she's, she's... And he saw something 
in the corner of his eye that stopped him in his tracks. A tiny flicker of hope that he instantly clung onto and refused to let go, where Ashleen's chest was slowly, ever so slightly, rising and falling in tiny, minuscule motions, almost imperceptible to the naked eye, but not to him. She's alive! My daughter is alive! Look, she still breathes yet! The somber crowd all craned in their necks at once, eyes widening with disbelief at what they saw. For yes, Ronan was right. Ashleen was in fact still breathing. Not wanting to waste another moment, Ronan carefully slid his arms underneath his daughter's limp body and lifted her up into the air. He bundled her tight against his chest and then quickly set off on the long walk back to the cottage, Ashleen's arms swaying this way and that as she was carried back home by her father. She seemed to all the world to be lifeless, but Ronan could feel the tiniest bit of warmth emanating from her body, like the last remaining embers of a fire that just refused to die out. In truly astonishing time, he arrived back home, kicking open the door and then laying her gently down into her bed. He wrapped her up warm and tight with every blanket that he could find and then lit a fire in the cold hearth. And by this time the crowd had caught up with him and they were now doing what they could to help too, fetching hot water, bringing herbs and medicines, doing all they could to save their beloved Ashleen and avert this awful tragedy. For three days they came and went, ensuring that Ashleen was well catered for with food, drink and all manner of herbal remedies to slow her worsening fever and breathe some life back into her poor body. In all that time, her father never left her side, hardly eating or drinking himself, he just sat there, holding her hand and asking and begging all the gods he knew for help and intervention to bring his daughter back to him and save her innocent soul. But no answer ever came. He could only stare on helpless as his daughter's unknown condition worsened, still just about clinging to life, but fading fast. And that was until the third night, when a strange sound was heard all around Ronan's little cottage. It started off with a kind of low rustling through the trees, but then began to change into something more ethereal. It sounded like someone whispering into a deep well, too distorted and echo to determine the actual meaning of whatever was being said. The crowd gathered round Ashleen's bedside, glanced around at each other in fear and confusion. Few of their braver members ventured out into the cold night and were met with the dazzling glow of an otherworldly light. Well, they quickly slammed the door shut and huddled back to the bedside where Ronan was still grasping Ashleen's limp hand. He looked around at the long shadows entering his home, now entirely unrecognisable to him. A cold breath began to spread out on the windows, forming crystals of frost on the freezing panes of glass. The spirit voice was heard even louder now, low and lamenting, as though right behind the window. Then, a sudden and awful chill swept into the room, extinguishing the great fire in an instant as though it were nothing but a tiny flickering match. Complete and utter darkness fell upon the frightened crowd, like the great shadowy wing of some colossal raven. The spirit's voice seeped into the room, its whisperings floated through the empty air and settled above Ashleen's sleeping body. It then took in a horrid, rasping gasp of air into its ancient wheezing chest. It paused for one eternal moment as all that were gathered there also held their breaths for fear or helpless anticipation they did not know. And then the spirit breathed out again, a cloud of unimaginable coldness that plumed down to Ashleen, 
enveloping her body in its rigid, unfaltering embrace. Ashleen's lips parted open, and she too breathed out one final time. The spirit voice then faded away, and the room fell into silence as Ronan felt his daughter's hand grow very cold. He reached out and touched his fingertips to her forehead, although he already knew she was gone. And the next morning, young Ashleen was pronounced dead, exactly three days after she collapsed on that Samhain night. Three days after her father came across the old woman in the bog, and thus the dark prophecy of the Banshee came true, according to the time foretold by that spirit of death.